uh, it's a real pleasure today. This is uh, our biostatistics grand rounds talk for, for uh, the school year. And uh, we're really, really honored to have uh, Professor Frank Harrell from Vanderbilt University here visiting us. And he's actually giving this talk and then he's giving another talk within the Division of Biostats in, in a couple hours as well. So uh, please feel free to, to attend that one uh, as well. So let me give you a little bit of a, a background uh, about Frank and, and, and how he's arrived to where he is in, in his life. Um, he got his PhD in biostatistics at UNC Chapel Hill back in 1979, working with a, a very esteemed statistician, P.K. Sin. And um, after that, he, was, he actually spent a number of years at Duke University. He was uh, in the departments of uh, in biometry and cardiology at the uh, Clinical Research Institute at Duke University for about 17 years. He then went to uh, the University of Virginia, where he founded the Division of uh, Biostatistics and Epidemiology over there in the Department of Health and Evaluation Sciences. In 2003, uh, Frank became the founding chair of the Department of Biostatistics at Vanderbilt. He's been there uh, a little over 10 years now. Um, so Frank, is, he's devoted his career in, in a broad range of areas, and I'll, I'll read you a little bit from his bio. So he's, he's very, been very, very interested in the study of uh, patient outcomes, um, and the development of accurate prognostic diagnostic models. Um, and he's, he's taken his methodologies and applied them to areas of health services and outcomes research, technology evaluation, observational databases, and clinical trials. Um, and he's also developed a bunch of method methodologic research around developing reliable statistical models, quantifying predictive accuracy. For those of you that work in survival models, there's something called the Harold C statistic gentleman that developed it, um, using data reduction strategies for modeling, uh, looking at transformations, appropriate transformations and validation methods, uh, shrinkage estimation, missing data, a whole range of areas that, that Frank is really contributing to. The other thing that many, many, many of you at one point in your life will, will encounter is software, and Frank has been instrumental in writing really, really high-level, user-friendly code taking things that are appearing in the literature, very modern techniques, and bringing them to the masses in, in elegant ways. Um, so again, it's a real honor. He's a fellow of the American Statistical Association, and, uh, and he's an uh, editor, associate editor of Statistics and Medicine. He's on the editorial board of the American Heart Journal, and a policy advisory board of the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. Uh, he's also written a, a, a very well-known book in Springer called Regression Modeling Strategies, that actually I was really lucky enough to be able to review here. Back, so, uh, and most of all, uh, he's a true gentleman, so we're, we're <laughs> truly honored to have him. Welcome. I really appreciate that kind introduction, and I really appreciate the kind review you made of my book uh, many years ago. Uh, so thank you, Sunil. I want to thank Margaret Byrne for the, the nice invitation. Many months ago, we started arranging this, and I really appreciate this invitation. And uh, Michelle Gomez for doing a great job. Can you hear from um, yeah. is, that, is that working? I'll just, okay, good. I, I want to uh, also thank Michelle Gomez for the great job arranging this trip. Um, there's a lot of principles that we believe in in uh, statistics, and many of them are related to uh, design, and that's where we can do usually our our most good is uh, design of studies, experimental design. But we also have principles uh, related to analysis of data. And one of the most fundamental principles is to preserve the information in the data and to use all the available information. Sometimes we don't speak up enough about that and we take uh, for granted what some of our colleagues in medical research give us where they've really sacrificed information and, and preserving all the available information needs to be a fundamental tenet of uh, statistical analysis. So we are, we're a very helpful type of uh, collaborators and we're kind and gentle usually and we don't always speak up for what we believe in. So this talk was sort of a reaction to that and giving you a few things to stand up about. I was looking at uh, the definition of an epidemic uh, 
on the web this morning and one definition is it's something that affects many people and is transmitted from person to person. And I think information allergy is, is a pretty good example of that. It's actually a very, very prevalent condition uh, because we keep uh, teaching things that are uh, not optimal. And more than that, uh, when suboptimal analyses are used in the medical literature, people read those papers and they keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and then they think that that was the way to analyze the data. And so we really need to fight that. So the, the idea is in, in life is that we make the best decisions when we have available to us the most information. So information is the basis for decision making and the information that you want someone to have access to is all possible information that they're conceivably capable of handling. So I'm going to give you some uh, several examples of uh, what I call information allergy, which is ignoring uh, available information and in some cases refusing to use information. Uh, we know politicians are pretty good at that and they will actually uh, uh, misuse or, or ignore information if it serves their, their ends. Uh, before that I wanted to go through some definitions of information. Uh, so these, these are several definitions you can get off the uh, internet. Uh, messages used as the basis for decision making is a nice short definition. I think it's a very good one. Uh, can be the result of processing data and organizing data uh, to add knowledge. Um, the value of information is really judged by the quality of the outcomes to which the information uh, leads. There's, there's certain types of information such as great poetry and uh, novels, great novels in the literature that are not meant to be giving you better decisions, they're just meant to give you a beautiful experience. So that's, that can be a different category. Uh, so the optimum decisions are made by uh, taking the maximum amount of information and the most current information uh, that you can handle and incorporating that into your decisions. So what are the decisions that we have to make in biostatistics in our related uh, biomedical research fields? Uh, we have to make decisions about biological pathways and mechanisms of action, such as action of drugs. Uh, what's the best way to use uh, molecular information to diagnose or treat disease? Uh, what biomarkers should be used to monitor a patient being treated for, uh, say, a cancer? Uh, how should you summarize biomarkers? What's the best way to, to do a diagnosis or to, to uh, estimate prognosis of patients? In epidemiology, it's very common to look at risk factors and you need to make an inference about whether the risk factor is just reflecting something else or is it a causal agent? How should we measure patient outcomes? Uh, is a drug effective and who should get a drug? Those are all decisions and you can think of many, many more that we have to make. So information allergy uh, takes two forms. One is uh, failing to obtain information uh, to make a sound decision. Uh, so an example in a clinical trial would be not collecting important baseline data, and I'll be expanding on that quite a bit. Uh, and another one is having the information and then refusing to use it. So you might, uh, as is very common the case in, in uh, biomarker research, Biomarker research is sort of a sexy field where everyone's always trying to discover a new marker and to get known for the marker. And there's a tendency when that happens to overstate the value of the marker and we see that as a rampant problem in biomarker research. So the marker may be a potentially profit-making uh, enterprise or a career-making discovery. It may not uh, be as good as basic clinical data. Uh, there's been a lot of papers recently in some of the key medical journals about the future of big data and some people are saying big data does away with the need for randomized clinical trials. Well, I hate to tell them that's, that's awfully naive. Um, uh, and so the, the, the clinical data that we get from clinical trials and clinical research will never lose its value. Ignoring alternate explanations for things such as confounders, ignoring subject heterogeneity, uh, categorizing continuous variables, 
or categorizing subject responses, uh, categorizing predictions as right or wrong. And then we have a lot of clinicians that really understand probabilities, but they assume that they don't understand probabilities. So they will tell you they can't deal with them. And they really deal with them all the time in their minds. Um, and of course, anybody that uh, goes to the dog track or horse track gets to be really, really good with probabilities. And so it doesn't take uh, uh, even a college education to be great at dealing with probabilities. But a lot of people are, seem to be afraid of them. Uh, so this is an example of um, looking at biomarkers. And some of these are pretty old biomarkers right now, looking for um, probability of death within 30 days is the, is the outcome. And so there's an old cardiac biomarker called CKMB, which has an ROC area or concordance probability of 0.63. And then there was a newer marker called troponin T, which was 0.69. A lot of cardio cardiovascular experts, for some reason, unbeknownst to anyone who can think, I believe, wanted to dichotomize that. So they say, we have a new marker of muscle damage, and we're going to ignore some of what we just spent money collecting. And so they dichotomize it as some lower limit, like 0.1. So you immediately sacrifice 0.05 in the ROC area. You can combine old and new markers together, uh, you combine that with EKG. And so in our New England Journal of Medicine paper studying troponin D, we failed to mention uh, in that paper that if you took the age and sex of the person, you get an ROC area of 0.8. And so that was nowhere to be found in that paper. And I was a co-author on that, so I share some of the guilt. So that is an example of ignoring really basic information. And age of sex is not even clinical. It's just demographic information. Another example of ignoring information is ignoring confounders. Uh, and, and nutritional epidemiology is sort of a special case because the foods that you eat are confounders for each other. If you were to have a constant caloric intake, and decrease the amount of protein that you get, you have to be increasing something else, like carbohydrate consumption. So it, uh, depending on whether you're in a steady weight or gaining or losing weight, it may be a zero-sum game. So the foods are really negatively correlated with each other. And so interpreting uh, what is the impact of high protein consumption, it's really hard to interpret without interpreting the impact of low carbohydrate consumption. So Sander Greenland had an amazing paper about this, and he really went after the field in nutritional epidemiology for doing analyses that did not simultaneously adjust for all the things it needed to adjust for. So his example was a classic case control study. This was breast cancer, 140 cases, 222 controls, 35 uh, food constituents were measured in diaries for food intake. There were five confounders, which is suspiciously low. Um, the food intakes, as I mentioned, are correlated. And it's common in, in this kind of research to do a, a something like a stepwise regression, which is a great way to ignore information. And it's also a very unstable technique that's, that doesn't replicate at all in other data sets. And so if you go through that uh, data set, you find that 11 foods seem to be associated with breast cancer. Uh, if, you if you adjust for all 35 foods simultaneously, which would be a little dangerous because that's a lot of parameters in the model, you still get two that have a significant uh, result. But the rigorous analysis that would be the simultaneous um, analysis, uh, which is a hierarchical random slopes model, where you can give each of the 35 foods its own slope, but not, ascent, not fit a whole parameter for each food. So you're tying the, the slopes together by a common variance of the random slopes. So that's a wonderful way to look at all 35 foods simultaneously and to bring stability to the analysis. And Greenland's article about this is just terrific. Um, and you find in that analysis there's no food associated with breast cancer. And so Greenland believes that's the right answer in this data set and probably many others. And so this is related to the fact that we see a, a press report about a food that's good for you, it's bad for you, and you just wait a few months and it's good for you. Uh, and, and we've seen that so many times, people have lost a lot of faith in the, in the whole line of research. 
a lot of the problem can be traced to flawed statistical methodology. Uh, another topic where we ignore information and it really matters is uh, ignoring subject uh, variability in randomized trials. So we know that randomization balances, uh, on the average, it balances both known and unknown factors and we really love it because of the unknown factors that we don't have to be correct in measuring will be balanced by randomization. But the problem with randomized trials is the subjects are very heterogeneous within a treatment group and that cannot be ignored. So there's famous statisticians throughout the world that say a clinical trial that doesn't result in a two by two table is uh, overly complex and a clinical trial should be understood by any idiot who reads the medical paper. Well, I think that's very, very dangerous thinking um, and it really results in sample sizes that are far too large, among other things. Uh, so there's a false belief that randomization makes it allowable to ignore subject heterogeneity, um, whereas analysis of covariance will take that into account and result in a much better analysis. So here's an example where there were 10,000 patients in one treatment group and 20,000 in another, and so balance is not the problem. It's not a problem in any sample size, but you can really see that it's not a problem when you get to a total sample size of 30,000. And so the, the age, the weight, the height, the proportion, female, everything you could measure is going to be amazingly balanced. And so uh, any distortion of the result that you get by doing uh, a simple unadjusted test is not going to come from imbalance. So uh, like many clinical studies, the primary endpoint was an unadjusted, the primary analysis was an unadjusted analysis. So this was the only trial I've ever seen where the design specifications were actually correct. So the study was designed to detect a reduction from 7% to 6% in absolute mortality at 30 days or a 15% uh, relative reduction in the odds of death. Those two numbers are exactly what happened when everything was done. I've never seen that before or since. So the, uh, you get a 15% relative reduction in the odds of death. If you covariate adjust, you get an 18% reduction in the odds of death. And we know from statistical theory that unadjusted estimates are systematically biased towards the null. And the statistical principle related to this is the non-collapsibility of the odds ratio. So 18 versus 15 sounds like a pretty minor difference. Uh, so why do we care? Well, one reason we care is the covert adjustment is free. It doesn't cost any money, doesn't take much time, it doesn't take much planning. Uh, but the real reason is that this would mean that to get the same power, you could have randomized 19% fewer patients. And in this size trial, that was 5,700 patients that were very expensive to collect, made the trial longer. Uh, this was a total 40,000 patient clinical trial. There's one treatment arm I didn't show you. So to save 19% sample size by doing something that costs no money and adjusting for age alone is going to have a pretty good impact is really uh, important. And we also use covariates for many other purposes, including to get an overall risk model, and this is a nomogram that shows the baseline risk as a function of age, how much shock you were in, measured by kiloclass, and we see an interaction between age and kiloclass. The systolic blood pressure, which gets flat at 120, uh, heart rate, which has a U-shaped relationship, whether you had a previous heart attack and the location of the heart attack, that gives you so many risk points, and that will give you the risk estimate on the, if you're a control patient, and from that you instantly get the mortality reduction by the expensive new treatment tissue plasminogen activator. So that lo lower axis is just the difference of two logistic regression models, and it's something you just calculate instantly. And you can see from this graph that this really matters, and so patients that have come in that are younger and who have smaller heart attacks are going to be at this lower uh, baseline risk over here. And you, you see the whole clinical trial is dominated by low-risk patients. There is a very small number of high-risk patients out here with risk above 0.2 at 30 days. This translates into a risk difference distribution that we try to ignore in clinical trials and should not ignore. 
that is really uh, tilted towards a very high number of patients getting very tiny benefit. And the patients that came in at high risk, some of them are going to get a lot of benefit. A lot of these are the oldest patients in the study, and those were the biggest heart attacks. So the distribution of risk difference is going to mimic the distribution of baseline risk that you started with. And you can see that the, um, there's a big difference between the mean and median uh, treatment difference. The unadjusted estimate is going to say there's a 1% reduction, but the typical patient gets about a 0.6% reduction in risk by this expensive drug. So cut points is uh, another way to ignore information and to add tremendous amount of instability and arbitrariness into every analysis. So physicians are trying to find cut points, and, and this is true of most physicians that I've ever met, and I've never understood the basic need, but I think the psychologists probably explain this better than anyone, is that we can only handle so many things in our head at one time, and we tend to develop simplifications. The most common simplification that we develop is um, racial prejudice. So racial prejudice is a way to distill a large number of things into a trivial signal based on skin color so that people who don't want to think can make quick decisions and they can know whether they like someone or not without taking the time to know the person. So that's just an extreme example of dichotomization. So the interesting thing about dichotomization to me is that mathematically you can show that the dichotomizations do not even exist unless there's a relationship that's discontinuous. And there's no relationships in nature that are discontinuous except for two. And that is when an event happens, uh, some, something can alter immediately. So if you drive a car off the cliff, your health status can be altered uh, instantly. Uh, so that is, means that if the variable on the x-axis is time, the effect of time can be discontinuous. So the time is the only variable where an event can interrupt everything. Um, the other one is age, so, and that's because of legal mandates. Uh, if you have an age 16 uh, driver's uh, license law, you'll see that males especially will have an increased mortality right at age 16. And so you have discontinuity around uh, driving age, voting age, military service age, and retirement age. Those are all legal mandates, and they generate discontinuities. Another one would be tax brackets. Uh, so tax brackets are, are completely unnecessarily discontinuous, and they increase cheating, whereas if you had continuously graduated tax rates, you would have less cheating. Uh, you wouldn't have boundaries to try to finesse for deductions. Even if a cut point exists, uh, the cut point would have to be a function of other things. Uh, if the variable that you're cutting is not time or age in the legal situation. And so I have a very simple demonstration of this, and this is one that everyone should burn into their mind. This is a very trivial, trivial example that a lot of clinicians have not thought about. Uh, so this is uh, taking some real data and just, just ignoring a whole lot of variables and asking, uh, if you had only two variables, how would you optimally diagnose pneumonia of infants who were uh, less than 90 days old in developing countries for pneumonia? So uh, to be called pneumonia, an infant had to have uh, four radiographers looking at the chest x-ray and declaring it indicative of pneumonia. And you see that we have two important variables, uh, which is the respiratory rate. So if your lungs are not functioning fully efficiently, you have to breathe more often to try to make up for it. And then cough is a clinical sign for pneumonia as well as a lot of other things. So if you were going to make an optimum decision, in this case the issue was do you admit a child to a hospital, knowing that the hospitals are sort of full and we have to make some tough decisions, we'd like to admit the more high risk uh, infants to the hospital. Um, what would be your optimum way to use respiratory rate and cough? Well, if you were a rational decision maker, the decision has to be made on this axis here. So this is the axis where you translate the risk to a decision 
and it will lead to an optimum decision when you couple that with the uh, utility function. So if you wanted to admit uh, a child to the hospital if their risk was above 0.3 of pneumonia, well if that child coughs, the respiratory rate would have to be greater than about 64 uh, for them to be a, a risk above 0.3, and if the child didn't cough, uh, the respiratory rate would have to be above 85. So you can see from this very simple example, and this will be repeated in every example you can ever make up, that if you did want to have a cut point on an input variable, that cut point is a function of the value of all of the other variables that relate to risk. So you could say there is a cut point that exists for respiratory rate, uh, but it's a continuous function of, uh, it's a function of cough. You, and you could say that for any other variable yet to the model. So if the cut point of one variable has to depend on the actual levels of all the other variables, you can see that your attempt to use a cut point to simplify the problem has completely backfired. And there's no value in terms of saving your time or, or your difficulty of making the decision and to even conceptualizing a cut point for the respiratory rate. So if you ever make a cut point, it has to be on the back end, and it can never be on the input side of the model. So think of all the biomarker research where people are making cut points on biomarkers, and then they have to measure more biomarkers to make up for the information they just threw in the trash can. And the cut points are invalid because they get the cut point for one biomarker has to be a function of the value of all the other biomarkers. Otherwise, you're just giving the wrong answer. So the literature is littered with this problem. Um, and so in uh, S-phase fraction as a marker in breast cancer prognosis, uh, 19 different cut points have been used in the literature. In um, Cathepsin D, there were 12 papers published. Every paper found a different cut point than every other paper. And there's a very basic lesson in this, is when you're searching for something that doesn't exist, you're going to almost always disagree with what other people find when they're searching for things that don't exist. So that meant that the uh, ASCO guidelines said if you guys can't get your act together, we can't recommend that these be used for markers. They may be really valuable markers, but it was the desire for cut points that made them seem silly. And the fact that somebody sought cut points was a highly questionable uh, decision. Uh, cut points lead to all kinds of uh, silliness. So Howard Weiner had a wonderful paper in Chance Magazine in 2006 where he actually published a very dangerous algorithm. He showed you can take any set of continuous variables where there's no correlation between X and Y. And he actually provided in the paper the algorithm that a lot of people might want to go off and use now to get more papers published, where you can find the set of cut points that will yield uh, an increasing relationship with the outcome and a different set of cut points that will yield a decreasing relationship from the same data set. And the data set was this one. So cut points can be easily manipulated and they can even change direction depending on what your current publication needs are. We see people developing cut points or using cut points uh, all the time, and I can't figure out why. And you know, they say the joke about epidemiologists is there are people broken down by age, race, and sex. Um, why do you want to break something down? There's this belief that if you categorize body mass index into light versus heavy, that the odds ratio you get in a logistic model actually means something. And it only means something because it's not understood. We have a lot of examples in life where people only, only think something is simple because they do not understand it. So what is the meaning of an odds ratio of 2.5 when you compare heavy to light people? It seems to be pretty simple, but it actually has no interpretation whatsoever. Um, so it results in inaccurate predictions. It's arbitrary. I, I gave a course once and there was a, a smoking researcher epidemiologist in the audience and he said, 
the smoking research community has developed a set of cut points that are universally adopted for cigarette smoking. And I said, show me the key papers. And he showed me the key papers, and not one of them used the same cut points for daily cigarette smoking as another. So what he remembered as a universally adopted set of cut points was completely bogus. So what is the problem? Why does high versus low uh, not give you an interpretable answer? It's because it represents an unknown mixture of highs and lows. And the way to make the odds ratio for body mass index get better, get bigger, is to add more very heavy people into the data or to add more very light people into the data. Both of those will make the odds ratio get bigger. So that is, uh, what that means is the, the, the effect of going from low to high is not a scientific quantity. The definition of a scientific quantity is a quantity whose interpretation doesn't depend on the context of the experiment. The uh, odds ratio from this uh, depends on the entire distribution of body mass index in the whole sample. It cannot be interpreted without knowing every single individual BMI in your sample. So it, by definition, is not a scientific quantity. So this is a, a nice example from one of the best papers that shows the evil of dichotomization, uh, where they said, uh, let's, let's fit a smooth relationship between bilirubin uh, and the hazard ratio in a Cox model using two different methods that sort of agree with each other or just forcing Billy Rubin to have a linear relationship on the log hazard. And you can see the linear relationship is going to be more accurate than finding a cut point. The cut point assumes a discontinuous relationship. It assumes that the cut point was actually correct, which is really dubious assumption. Um, and this has a ratio of 4.2 for high versus low bilirubin has no known interpretation. So people will quote that as, a, as, a, as an effect of bilirubin. And if you ask them to give a precise interpretation, their answer is, it's time for coffee. Think about a decision support system that tried to use this in a hospital setting and the cut point was 40, 45. Somebody who has a 44 is going to be triggering a completely different decision than somebody that has a 46. And that's just biologically silly. People are doing really strange things with dependent variables. So here's a bizarre hypertension study that luckily we, we don't see any other examples like this the, in the last several years. So they came up with this definition of a successful treatment. Uh, is the patient went down from a baseline diastolic blood pressure that was greater than or equal to 95 to being less than 90 or achieved a 10% reduction. So Stephen Sin is one of our greatest statistical detectives. He wrote this amazing book, Statistical Issues in Drug Development. And so one thing Stephen does is try to figure out what is the function that's really underlying this metric. And so he derived the response function. What is, your, what is the relationship between your baseline diastolic blood pressure and the probability that you'll be labeled as a responder in this hypertension therapy trial? And he shows that it's really, really good to have a baseline blood pressure of 95.1 because you have a really great chance of being labeled a success. That's a complete artifact to the arbitrary rule that was made up by the principal investigator. We have some clinicians saying that um, I've got, I'm doing this a traditional way, which is to get a difference in mean blood pressures. And some clinicians will say, well, the difference in mean blood pressure was 5.4. What's the clinical relevance of that? Well, those that really understand physiology will probably already understand the clinical relevance of that. But even those that don't should recognize that the 5.4 is much more clinically relevant than the proportion that are hitting some arbitrary target. So let's suppose you did a trial where in treatment A, 17% uh, of the patients hit the target uh, blood pressure reduction and 22% in treatment B hit the target. So you've just replaced one problem with another. You're saying that you don't understand the clinical relevance of 5.4, but you're saying to me that you know the clinical relevance of the difference between 17 and 22. That's a bit hard to believe. 
We have a problem with classification. Uh, so many studies attempt to classify patients as diseased or normal, and it's much better to talk about probabilities. You'll make better decisions. And the, the reason for that is that consequences of decisions are only known when you know more about the patient. You know that there are certain drugs you prescribe that they're not going to take. There are certain drugs they can't afford once they go home. There's all kind of things that come into play, educational level of patients. Uh, so you know the consequences at the point of care, but most biomarker research and what a lot of machine learning people are doing in biomedical high dimensional data analysis is they are making themselves the decision maker by creating dichotomizations. In other words, they are taking control of the utility loss or, or a cost function. Um, and that just doesn't work. So the analyst of a data set is never the possessor of the utility function. That's always the physician in consultation with the patient. So continuous probabilities serve multiple roles, and one of the most beautiful things about them is they, are, they have their own error rates. So a patient that has a probability of disease of 0.75, who you treat as if the patient has disease, well, by definition, your probability of being wrong is 0.25. So you don't want to ever forget what the probability was. Even after you trigger a decision, you might revisit the decision or be a little more careful or want more data before you make the decision. Um, Stephen Sin has a lot of quotes in the literature, including this one, uh, a lot of physicians like number needed to treat. They don't really know why they like it, but uh, the only way we're told the physicians can understand probabilities, odds being a difficult concept. Anyone who plays sports, uh, does sports betting or cards or anything else, uh, would really disagree with odds being a difficult concept. Just takes a little bit of getting used to. So I, what I've seen over the years is this uh, systematic problem is that we have multiple dimensions of humans uh, that we need to take into account in uh, medical research, especially clinical trials and diagnostic and prognostic research. So we have all these dimensions that need to be captured, including resource availability and cost and utilities and preferences. Um, and what is the goal of statistics is to reduce uh, a lot of those variables down into one dimension, which is filtered through a statistical model. So statistical models can take into account age, cigarette smoking, extent of disease, symptoms, all sorts of other things, and that might give you a risk prediction. But that doesn't mean the statistician knows anything about utilities uh, or, or cost or patient uh, wishes. And so what we need to do in analyzing data is to reduce as many things into one dimension as we can, but the total problem is always having more dimensions than the baseline data that we're making predictions from. And the utilities will, will come in at the point of decision and they will alter the threshold for action. And the statisticians attempt to, to take the decision out of the physician's hand which you think is far-fetched, but it's true in the vast majority of biomarker research and a lot of genomics research is very wrong. Classifying um, predictions as right or wrong is an arbitrary dichotomization that is leading biomarker and genomics research badly down the wrong road. So we see a lot of analysis being done in high, dimension, high dimensions uh, using proportion classified correct. And we've known since the 1970s uh, in the German medical decision-making literature that uh, proportion classified correctly is an improper scoring rule. So an improper scoring rule is one that if you optimize, you'll give the wrong answer. You'll find the wrong features, you'll make the wrong decisions, you'll have the wrong model. Um, so a proportion classified correct is an attempt to use minimum information and anytime you use minimum information, you can have low statistical power, high standard errors, arbitrary choice, depending on the cutoff, and you're forcing a binary decision without having a gray zone. Uh, and again, you're taking the analyst to be the provider of the utility function. 
sensitivity and specificity are also improper scoring rules. So if you optimize them, you'll have the wrong answer. And I'll talk more about that in the other talk. Um, so here's an example of simulated data where if you look at any reasonable measure of statistical predictive ability, such as concordance probability or CRE uh, chi-square, you see that adding sex to age increases your ability to discriminate the outcome. And you can see that adding sex to age here adds a tremendous amount to the chi-square, adds a lot to the ROC area, but it actually makes the proportion classified correctly decrease. So you start at 0.622 classified correctly with only age, and you add the sex variable and you make your accuracy worse. So the inference from that is the sex variable has negative information in it. And you should not use the sex variable. Uh, and if you use the sex variable, it's almost the same as just making a random guess, not using the data. And that's not because the sex variable is not important. That's because proportion classified correct is an improper scoring rule. And it will give you the wrong conclusion. Uh, we've seen this problem over and over, especially in genomics, where people are using proportion classified correctly. And there was a paper by uh, Michaels who, who found in 05 that all published gene microarray studies uh, not only were wrong, but they actually were finding signal when no signal existed at all in the data. And that was a very big eye-opener because we know that most microarray studies published before 2005 were misleading, but their whole analysis was misleading because they used the wrong statistical test in reanalyzing the studies from the literature, and they used proportion classified correct, and they just did resplits of the data to show that the microarray discovery did not replicate. If you use multiple repeats of tenfold cross-validation, you use a better statistical index, and you, you deal with sensor data correctly, you find that uh, gene microarrays actually do have signals in them, but it was the improper analysis that made you get the wrong answer, or if you reanalyze the data by splitting the data again, to falsely conclude there was no signal in the data. So these statistical decisions really, really matter uh, to the research. So continuous markers avoid a lot of problems, and they avoid a lot of arbitrariness, so this is one of the most commonly used marker, the prostate-specific antigen for prognosis in prostate cancer. These are uh, this data from Cleveland Clinic, um, and the data are from men who had already had a resection, so they'd already had surgery for prostate cancer. Then you're looking for recurrence in two years. So the P PSA that's measured right after the resection is very prognostic of the recurrence, and it's a very smooth nonlinear relationship. Uh, whereas the staging systems that are used in prostate cancer are very arbitrary and they impose cut points on PSA. And they only give a limited number of prognostic estimates. So the staging systems sacrifice tremendous information uh, and they only use one or two cut points on PSA, whereas PSA gives you a much better prognostic spectrum. And if you add other variables to it, you'll do even better to get a much better prognostic spectrum. Now this matters because this is the predicted risk of two-year recurrence for the same man just taken forward to the different, to use the different markers and different uh, statistical models. So the pr prognostic estimate you get for that same man varies all over the place. And the message here is we ought to be using the maximum information method to get the best estimate, which might be up towards here. But these staging systems uh, what happens with many cancer staging systems is that you dichotomize uh, input variables and you make the whole staging system to be no more valuable than one of the continuous markers that you dichotomize just to put into the staging system. So you get a false comfort <laughs> from a staging system that uses histologic grade and PSA and other things, whereas the continuous marker by itself may have been better. I'm uh, going to change topics just for a break, just to talk about visual information, because we've been talking about quantitative information. Uh, so um, the dynamite plot, and we have a web page in our department devoted to the evils of dynamite plots. It looks like you're 
pushing the plunger to blow something up, uh, is, a, is a very high ink to information ratio display. It hides a lot of information. Uh, and it could show so much more. So this is a, just a redrawing of one dynamite plot um, to show how you can, you can get so much more information. Now often we have lots of arguments about things and pictures can really uh, settle a lot of the arguments. This is one of the pictures from history that settled more arguments than most any other picture. So this was a picture that Galileo draw, uh, drew and this picture appeared in one of the sentences of his book as a little bitty drawing when he first saw the rings of Saturn. And so there were all these arguments and this one picture uh, liberated us from uh, these wordy arguments. And there's many other pictures from history that liberate us from arguments or, or enlighten us. So everyone knows slavery was terrible. This is a very accurate drawing of a uh, captured slave ship. Um, it was captured around 1821 or something. And w when the uh, engraver Hawksworth made the drawing, and this was put up around uh, England uh, by the Society of Friends as an anti-slavery uh, news uh, piece, um, you really get, you get the feeling of what slavery really means when you see a, a drawing like this. And you can look at it in more detail and see exactly how the shackles were placed and how people were placed to optimize space both vertically and, and uh, horizontally. So uh, learning uh, from these pictures, it just gives you a much more definite feeling about what it was all about, as do these amazing uh, depictions in this atlas of uh, slave trade uh, came out in 2010. This is an amazing book if you get to look at it. So you see these circles that are showing you the, um, uh, the slave voyages, uh, where they were organized and where the slave orders were placed. And you see these uh, size of the circle is uh, proportional to the number of slaves that were ordered uh, from those various uh, locations in planning the voyages to kidnap individuals. So we know there were between 12 and 20 million people kidnapped uh, to, to supply slaves, and it's, it's quite uh, amazing that ever happened. Uh, this, is a, this tells so much of a story so quickly. Of course, any time geography is involved, maps are just the natural thing that we, we don't always have in statistical displays. But this shows the volume and direction of the slave trade from the places where the kidnappings were done uh, to where the slaves ended up and with the width of these arrows proportional to the number of people. So that's visual information could be very strong. And then I'm gonna finish up with uh, one big example of numeric information. And so the claim here is that ignoring information kills people. So this is uh, a typical electrocardiogram for someone who had suffered a heart attack and is being monitored in a cardiac care unit. Uh, and we, uh, cardiologists saw back in the 70s, maybe earlier, that there was a pretty high frequency of premature ventricular contractions uh, followed by a compensatory pause. And then it was observed that people that had a very high frequency of premature ventricular contractions, they tended to have a higher sudden death rate. So Bernie Lound uh, was a famous cardiologist and humanitarian, and he developed the theory uh, of the arrhythmia suppression hypothesis and said that any prophylactic program against sudden death much, must involve the use of antiarrhythmic drugs to uh, lower the degree of premature ventricular contractions. And we know from uh, epidemiology and from clinical trials that just because a risk factor exists uh, doesn't mean that modifying the risk factor will make people do better. So the best example of that is probably nowadays is HDL cholesterol. So nobody's ever demonstrated that raising your HDL cholesterol gives you any better clinical benefit of, in, any, in any fashion. Uh, but it's taken as gospel that, that uh, low HDL is bad and you should probably do something about it. Um, 
So in this paper, uh, they, they categorized their main variable of interest, the frequency of hourly frequency of premature ventricular contractions, uh, which is a bit of a problem. And you see that the, uh, as the frequency of contraction goes up, the one-year cardiac mortality goes up. Uh, this was a paper from the Multicenter Post Infarction Research Group in 83, and there's a little bit of history to this. The statisticians that were working on this project at Rochester, New York, University of Rochester, I went to visit there, and we went out to dinner about 1982 or something, and we got in a huge argument at a restaurant about dichotomization and almost got thrown out of the restaurant. You guess which side I was on. But the two statisticians in this project, they were lovers of the SAS cat mod procedure. And they believed that every statistical analysis should be a categorical data analysis. And that was the heart of our argument. And you can see how that was reflected in their end result here. So they not only took uh, important variables and dichotomized them, they then put the yes-no variables into a statistical model and didn't even use the regression coefficients out of that model, so now they've ignored two levels of information. They just counted how many things were present. So they're assuming all the regression coefficients are equal in magnitude. Uh, and there's some very fascinating things that happen when you relate the number of positive risk factors to the uh, cardiac mortality. If you look at the 12-month cardiac mortality, you can see that it varies from about 3% to about 47%. And those two numbers are actually very meaningful in a surprising way. So just keep in mind, 3% prognostic spectrum to 47%. If you use a multivariable model, uh, which needed you to dichotomize everything, this is the single most important variable in that model. And if you look at that variable all by itself, the prognostic spectrum that it has is 3% to 47%, just by dumb luck. That one variable that they had dichotomized at uh, 40, and of all the places that dichotomized, what a crazy choice. So that's assuming all these people have the same prognosis, but that's really the steepest part of the curve. So from that curve, there's no place that would dichotomize this properly but certainly not 40. So using that one variable by itself gives you the same prognostic ability as the whole model when you dichotomize things. But this led to another problem. Um, there was uh, this desire to prevent premature contraction, so this, this famous clinical trial was organized uh, in the belief that if you lowered the incidence of premature contractions, you would help people. So we know that lowering a risk factor doesn't mean you're going to help anybody, but we do know that you need to show that it's a risk factor. So your first step in devising an intervention is to show that the thing you're calling is a risk factor is a risk factor. And so you need to show that it has some independence of its effect from other things. So they didn't really show that, and that was the problem. So the launch of the cardiac arrhythmia suppression uh, clinical trials was based on a somewhat false premise. And it was ignoring the information in left ventricular ejection fraction that if you had adjusted for that, the, the premature ventricular contractions would have been washed away as a risk factor. So the famous CAST study uh, randomized patients to different antiarrhythmics. Um, and the cardiologists felt that it was unethical to randomize anybody to placebo. The statisticians were those who argued strongly that we need a placebo control in this randomized trial. Uh, the trial was designed as a one-tailed test. The stopping boundaries had only one direction to them, and the final analysis was to be a one-tailed p-value because there was absolutely no chance that the antiarrhythmic drugs would cause a problem. But what happened? Study was stopped prematurely, and at the point it was stopped, there were two and a half times the rate of death in the drug group as in the placebo group. So not only the drug didn't help, it actually killed people. And the best estimate of the number of patients who died from being exposed to these drugs in the United States alone uh, was between 24,000 and 69,000 deaths, and that was the subject of Thomas Moore's book. 
uh, deadly medicine. That number is very much in the range of the more recent experience we have with Vioxx that more people are familiar with. Very similar estimate of the number of deaths. So the arrhythmia suppression hypothesis was refuted. Uh, PVCs are really an indicator of underlying damage that's permanent and in and of itself wasn't uh, necessary to treat. Now I should say a caveat to that is when you analyze the importance of PVCs, that was dichotomized as well. So they were underplaying the role of PVCs, but then they dichotomized ejection fraction, which resulted in a major overplaying of the impact of PVCs. So we really need to do that analysis continuously for all the variables to get the, exactly the right and best answer. So that's where I claim that uh, dichotomization kills, and we see dichotomization doing untold damage in statistical analysis in all fields, and the dichotomization being very unreliable and arbitrary. So uh, in closing, I wanted to say that information is a wonderful thing to use, but it can be very expensive. So one of our examples from history is the missionaries coming to Africa made a trade, and uh, some people claim that the trade wasn't extremely fair. So the information that they left the original inhabitants of the land was um, very expensive to them. And then a very wise person said, information itself has a liberal bias. So I appreciate everybody listening, and thanks again for the invitation.